Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining the session today. We're talking about the Fulbright Professional Scholarship in Nonprofit Leadership today, but I'll just give a bit of a brief overview over the Fulbright program to anyone who's never heard of it. The Fulbright program is essentially your ticket to, to study and research at some of the world's most prestigious institutions. Just a little bit about the history of Fulbright. The aim of the program is to promote educational and cultural exchange around the world through a program of, of uh, study and research scholarships. And it was created in 1946 following the Second World War by Senator J. William Fulbright from Arkansas. Uh, as a, a Rhodes Scholar himself, Fulbright uh, believed in the transformative power of international exchange and cultural empathy. And in order to avoid the destruction that he saw in World War II, he had this idea to, to turn swords into plowshares. So essentially selling off surplus war armaments left over after World War II to fund uh, educational and research exchange programs to and from the United States, increasing the flow of people and ideas and reducing the chance of future conflict. Since then, the program has grown to become one of the largest in the world operating between the US and over 160 countries. And in Australia, in our 70 year history, we funded over 5,000 Australians and Americans to undertake these programs of exchange. So as mentioned, we're talking about the nonprofit leadership scholarship today, but Fulbright funds scholarships in, in all uh, fields and disciplines. Um, to give you an idea, uh, we fund scholarships in four categories and the nonprofit award sits in the scholar award category. So it's generally for mid to late career applicants uh, people who are looking to undertake shorter term uh, um, research exchange programs. This is the full scholar award category. And as you can see, it's quite a, a large category. Uh, I'm just showing you this because anyone who applies for a Fulbright will automatically be considered in the general category, but you can nominate to be considered for additional awards, including the, the nonprofit leadership awards. So make sure if you're applying for a Fulbright, make sure you look around our catalogue and see if there are additional awards that you might be eligible for so that you can uh, get, get a couple of opportunities to be selected. So the non-profit uh, award, uh, it's, I'll give you a bit of a, an idea of the background. It was funded by Perpetual Limited, uh, sorry, it, it was funded uh, back in, in um, created back in 2011 and it was originally funded by the Origin Foundation and the Australian Scholarships Foundation uh, with the first two awardees traveling to the US in 2013. Uh, over the next eight years uh, another eight nonprofit leaders have been selected for this opportunity and we'll speak to five of them today. So uh, the scholarship provides an opportunity for an emerging leader in the nonprofit sector to undertake a program of research uh, or or professional development in the US with an approved US charitable organization for a period of three to four months. It's valued up to 30,000 Australian dollars, uh, including living and travel expenses. Uh, and to be competitive for this award, uh, you must have an undergraduate qualification. Uh, it's good to have uh, a minimum 10 years work experience, uh, a record of achievement gained from uh, three years employment at a mid to senior level position as a manager or director within the NFP sector. Um, an established leadership profile within the sector and a record of achievement. So that's, um, you know, uh, ideas that you've uh, introduced to the sector or programs that you've led. Uh, also demonstrated active participation or leadership on sector issues and policy development. Uh, demonstrated impact through leadership initiative and innovation in program development and delivery. And a high potential for future achievement evidenced by reputation for integrity. General, general positive values and motivation to make a difference or enact social change within uh, an identified uh, area of significance. And underpinning, underpinning all of this, the, the aim of the award is to provide an opportunity to study, conduct research into and gain experiential learning in uh, leadership and the operations of US nonprofit sector organizations. So that's why um, I've invited uh, some of these fantastic Fulbright nonprofit leaders uh, to speak to us today, just to sort of unpack that a little bit and find out their thoughts on it. Um, so applications are assessed on the quality of proposal for study, research and experiential learning, perceived benefits to the Australian nonprofit sector, and a willingness to share findings and knowledge, uh, um, share findings and knowledge within the sector and uh, relevance of, of um, your proposed program uh, to the, the United States. Um, so, uh, 
uh, I'd love to introduce our, our panelists to begin with. Uh, the, the inaugural rep recipient was Tessa Boyd Kane back in 2013. Uh, Tessa has uh, always had an interest in public value, uh, public value and social justice. As a former deputy C CEO of the Australian Council of Social Service uh, and the current CEO of Health Justice Australia, she works to assist and advocate on behalf of those who have no voice of their own. Through a Fulbright scholarship, Tessa spent four months in the US researching issues around how nonprofit organisations can strengthen and lead the trust and confidence in which the sector is held. The result of her, of her research is a report titled Lead or Le Be Left Behind, Sustaining Trust and Confidence in Australia's Charities. Tessa's findings shine a light on the shortfalls of the sector and how nonprofits as recipients of meet the public demand for, for clarity in order to sustain their impact well into the future. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning, Tessa. We've also got Karen Hart, our 2014 recipient. Karen is course chair and researcher in youth work and criminal justice at Victoria University. Prior to this, she was CEO of the Youth, youth Junction Inc, specializing in not-for-profit co-located youth service management. Karen was awarded a Fulbright scholarship for ongoing and dedicated work in leading a unique co-located model of youth services for disadvantaged young people. Through her scholarship, Karen studied the critical success factors for implementation and operation of similar models through the Nonprofit Centres Network at the Alliance Centre in Colorado. Her report, her report titled, More Than the Sum of Its Parts, an Exploration of Co-Located Centres, highlights findings to inform co-located models of best practice to improve efficiency and effectiveness in the delivery of nonprofit youth services in Australia. Thanks for joining us, Karen. Uh, our 2018 recipient, David Ireland, is a, an adjunct professor at the University of Queensland Business School and the Chief Innovation Officer at Think Place, a leading, a leading strategic design and innovation consultancy. It's also a board member for several not-for-profit and for-profit organisations. So David used his Fulbright scholarship to spend four months at Stanford University in the US, establishing a formal relationship between the UK Business School and Stanford in researching, understanding and addressing complex system, systems and challenges. As a particular focus, he developed practical methods, tools, and initiatives for people and organizations to use towards achieving the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, arguably the world's most complex challenges, which seek to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for all. Thanks for joining us, David. Uh, Adam Davids, our 2019 recipient. Uh, Adam is a proud Aboriginal Australian and descendant of the Wiradjuri people in Western New South Wales. As the Director of Learning at Career Trackers, he is supporting thousands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students to obtain a university degree, pursue professional employment, become leaders of industry and role models for future generations. Adam used his Fulbright Scholarship to analyse the pathway to generate sustainable jobs for underrepresented minorities by studying leading NGOs and historic institutions in the US. Now back in Australia, he plans to continue building a global alliance between inroads career trackers and other NGOs across the US to create professional, a professional jobs consortium for underrepresented minorities and unlock ongoing collaboration with a vision to elevate the social and economic impact of organizations and their beneficiaries. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Uh, um, we've also got uh, our most recent recipient, Dermot O'Gorman. Uh, Dermot is passionate, passionate about people and the planet. As a global leader in sustainable development, he spent the past 18 years as CEO of the World Wildlife Fund in the Pacific, then WWF China, and now WWF Australia. Dermot has driven innovation thinking within WWF, especially on digital technologies, overseeing the establishment of WWF Panda Labs and WW, WW, WWF's first global venture in OpenSC, of which he is the chair of the board. As a Fulbright scholar, Dermot will work with Stanford University's Digital Civil Society Lab on rethinking the future of non-government organisations. Research will look at the blurring of lines between profit and non-profit sectors uh, and how digital disruption is reshaping the notion of what civil society is and how it engages with stakeholders. He will explore the reimagining of environmental NGOs globally, strengthening uh, Australia-US civil society networks, and uh, contributing to peer-to-peer -peer learning with philanthropy and NGO leaders. His 2020 plans were delayed due to COVID, COVID travel restrictions, but he's set to move forward with his plans as soon as it's safe to travel. Thanks 
lot for joining us. Uh, finally, we have uh, Samantha Sayers, CEO of the Australian Scholarships Foundation. Um, as the CEO of ASF, Sam brings uh, more than 20 years of diversified cross-sector experience, including senior roles at Johnson & Johnson, a variety of commercial consultancy work focusing on the manufacturing and retail sectors in both Australia and Europe. Sam began tra transitioning to the NFP sector 10 years ago and has worked with leading NGOs in philanthropy. She has government's experience Governance experience in early childhood and the non for profit sector, serving as board member of the Children's Protection Society Victoria. Sam has also served on the YWCA Sydney board and chaired their marketing committee. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning, Sam. Uh, so I'll go straight into the questions and I might start with Derman uh, as, as you're the most recent uh, recipient, so you'll be quite uh, familiar with your project. Can you tell us a little bit about your Fulbright project uh, at Stanford University? Um, and, uh, thanks for the opportunity to update. I um, this Fulbright been a long time coming, and I'm still not a hundred percent sure when I will be able to leave the country. But um, I'm confident, thanks to the support of the um, team at Fulbright, that it will happen um, during the course of the next twelve months. The I'm. I'm constantly living in my current job, some of the research that I was wanting to do uh, at Stanford in their digital disruption civil society lab um, that I was going to spend three months in because um, COVID has accelerated a, num a lot of the changes that I was looking at two years ago when I applied for my Fulbright. And so um, I feel that um, by the time that I do get to Stanford, um, that um, I will have been living um, and working with colleagues both here and in the US who are dealing with some of those challenges that have been accelerated um, during the COVID period. Um, I, but I was reflecting on my um, application this morning in prep for this and a lot of what remains relevant. I guess the the piece to, um, to people who are thinking about applying for a scholarship is that um, the, the world is changing very fast and it's hard to manage for the smaller changes that are happening and, that are, and the uncertainty. But in fact, the bigger mega trends that are impacting our business continue. And so being able to focus past the the day-to-day -day and into the the future as to what does the civil civil society look like in the context of what you're interested in um has um remained true through through this period um and so i'm i'm looking forward to picking that up um at Stanford and, and seeing how um, much has changed since i started thinking about this over the last three or four years so why did you choose the Digital Civil Society uh, as your, your host institution? I, I think twofold. Um, having worked a lot around the world, it was one of the few academic institutions that was really looking in a structural way at the, the changes that were happening to civil society. Um, the second piece is um, that the sort of the nexus of um, academic, civil society, not-for-profit, social ventures, big philanthropy, small philanthropy um, in the, the Bay Area makes it, I think, a, a great place to spend um, time and really interact with a lot of um, people and organisations that are doing some really cutting edge thinking about where the world is going in this space. And I, and I think um, I see the amount of money lining up behind the SDGs in untraditional ways, and it's super exciting about the potential. Absolutely. Uh, and in terms of the application itself, uh, I think I mentioned earlier that um, uh, the, the awards requirement is for a con contribution to Australia's uh, nonprofit sector through research and experiential learning in the US. So how do you feel that your application addressed this requirement for, for research and experience, experiential learning specifically? Um, I, look, my, my guidance here was built on 
what you have at home already. And and I'm you know all of the people on this call have a very large network of civil society and and you know uh, social ventures and other philanthropists who they interact. And I, I've the approach I took was to build on those networks here, um, and some of the networks I had in the US and be able to be a catalyst of exchange between um, the US and and here. I thought a lot about how to bring it back in Australia and make it relevant to Australia. It's not about bringing an idea from the US and trying to force it to work here. It's about how we take the con you know, the high level insights and then turn them into something that can work for Australian civil society. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. Um, I might go to Tessa Boyd Kane. Uh, Tessa, you were one of the first recipients back in 2013 when you headed to the Foundation Center. American 501 nonprofit headquartered in New York. Uh, state mission is to strengthen the social sector by advancing knowledge about philanthropy in the US and around the world. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your project in the center? Thanks, Alex, and hi, everyone. Um, my project aim was really to explore how American charities and philanthropic organizations build trust and confidence in what they do, and then to translate the lessons of that the Australian charitable and nonprofit sector. And at the time that I was preparing my application, there was a raft of reform activity really led by government, um, but with strong support from the charitable sector to improve trust and confidence in Australia's charities. And the most significant example of that was the establishment of the National Charities Regulator, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. So I've been working really closely on that reform through my role at the Australian Council of Social Service, and I was really committed to it. But I also felt really strongly that regulation is only as effective as the culture within which it operates. And there was a risk, I thought, in some of the kind of narrative that was emerging from charities about being dependent on the regulator for our trust and confidence rather than being committed ourselves to driving our own accountability and transparency to the communities that we're here to support. And so I was really interested in thinking about how we build that culture of trust and confidence as, as a value that we hold. And in the United States, the philanthropic and charitable sectors have thrived without a strong culture of regulation. So I was really interested in exploring how they've done that and the lessons that we could learn for the Australian charitable landscape. And I mean, really for me, it was a great mix because I was split across two organisations, across two cities, and I had in the project as a whole, I had a mix between being sort of thrust into the world of US and international foundations and philanthropy, big, small, um, medium-sized organisations, but particularly looking at their efforts to understand, demonstrate and improve their own impact. And then at the same time, through a partnership with another organisation, I was grounded in a world of deep research and analysis of charity records, including particularly charity tax records, out of which um, think tanks were developing trend data. And we're only just starting to see the likes of that kind of data emulated here in Australia. So I had a really great combination of applied context and thinking about research and data and how we can use that to, to build trust and confidence in what we do. Absolutely. Um, so how did this affect uh, this experience affect you and, and your sort of um, career trajectory within the Australian nonprofit sector? Look, I don't think there's another opportunity that I know of for non-profit sector leaders where you can park your day job and spend several months reflecting really deeply on this incredible sector's work and our impact. And so through the process, I certainly learned a lot that helped my day job, that helped my work at the time and the work I've continued to do. But I also really, I guess, stepped back from my work and made the most of the art and the culture, the architecture that I had access to and the communities that I was immersed in as a result of living first in New York and then in Washington, D.C., and I think my reflection is that if we don't maintain our interest in life outside of work, our work suffers, we become boring and we start to stagnate as, as people and as leaders. And so the Fulbright experience was really an opportunity to lift my gaze from my immediate priorities and to connect more broadly with community need and with the role that not-for-profit organisations can play in meeting those needs. So, I mean, I think, you know, it inspired my interest in philanthropy. It inspired my interest in innovation, in doing better with what we have, um, which which in many ways has led to my current role, but mostly it just reinvigorated my passion for what I was doing and for improving how charities and nonprofits can support the communities um, that we're here to help. Wonderful, that's, that's really lovely to hear. Thanks, Tessa. Um, I might uh, move over to Adam Davids. You're the most recent returnee um, back from your, your four months at Inroads. 
a US nonprofit whose mission is to develop and place talented minority youth in business and industry and prepare them for corporate and community leadership. Can you tell us a little bit about Inroads and your, your work with them? So thank you. Well, thank, first of all, thank you so much for the invite. Um, the Fulbright was just such a transformative experience for me personally and professionally. Um, for the past 10 years, I've worked for Career Trackers, which is a nonprofit with a vision to create the next generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander executives in business, which is something that we've not seen in scale. Uh, and we are actually based on the Inroads organization in the US, which was a nonprofit founded in 1970, a historic NGO recognized by the King family. Um, and I suppose at that time in world history, you know, we know the 1960s uh, era in, in the US of the civil rights movement, uh, you know, led by folks like Dr. Martin Luther King and, and others fighting for social, economic and political justice. Um, and in the aftermath of that movement, um, aside from the legislative changes that were swept in, um, there was still a need for programs to actually take the next step and build uh, skills and networks and confidence of, of minority communities to take advantage of access to education and employment. And, and Inroads has been recognized as a trailblazer at doing so. Um, some of the alumni who completed an Inroads internship and, and took full advantage of their uh, employment opportunities to training and development um, include people like Tassanda Duckett, who just uh, retired from her post as the first African-American uh, and female CEO of JP Morgan Chase's retail business, um, and now is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, TIAA. Uh, Alan Goldston is uh, the president of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in the US, and he's an Inroads alumni. Um, another example is the, one of the nuclear commissioners of the US appointed by George Bush um, was an Inroads alumni, Bill Magwood. And so you sort of have this massive uh, community of, of minority, influential minority executives and business leaders, um, uh, which is quite incredible because um, being a 50 year old institution it kind of sets you know, an incredible opportunity for us in Australia to look at how can we develop the next generation of Indigenous executives, or in many cases, really the first uh, generation of, of, of ASX C-suite leaders uh, in the future. And so having been connected with them um, and, and looking at their, their history and their background uh, was really the catalyst for me going over there and, and spending quality time with them. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, we, we, we're at another bit of a watershed moment uh, with the George Floyd trials going on. Um, I think during your year, 2019, it was pre-COVID, but it was still quite a, a dramatic year for uh, civil rights movements. What was your experience like being over there during such a tumultuous time in, in history? I guess I had to take a step. So you, sort of, you back out the projects and, and my project was, as you described it, looking at, uh, you know, solutions regarding employment and also solutions for what is it going to take to build sustainability in, in nonprofits that serve minority communities? Is there anything unique in, in that, you know, programs that serve African Americans, Native Americans and Hispanic Americans? Um, and so, you know, looking at those things were quite important, but on arrival there, and I'm sure like, you know, most of us um, who, who have been, you know, you see a bunch of other stuff that's quite interesting. One of those things that really struck me was racial wealth inequality. Um, and, you know, the incredible depths of research that, that shows how, uh, you know, back to 1970 and today, in, in many ways, it's actually, we're in a worse situation, racially speaking, from a, an economic standpoint. And so why is that? Are there any programs, in fact, that can demonstrate that they've made a contribution to fixing this issue rather than sort of policy solutions? Uh, and so I, I, I got to, you know, catch full wind of that with the organisations that I spent time with, not just Inroads, a lot of other nonprofits that serve minority people as well. So that was really interesting to be able to kind of cross-reference my kind of initial research um, objectives and, and, and overlay that, uh, you know, around the ecosystem of, of programs that have served minority communities for even more than a century, uh, which is, I think, just quite unique in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you've actually just published a paper based on your, your time over in the US. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about it? For sure. So what my task was to do is, you know, rather than, I guess it's this narrative that you see on Aboriginal people all the time, is we have this sort of deficit mindset towards, you know, closing the gap and, you know, we've got to fix us and, and what have you. It's 
what I wanted to take was, was a strengths-based view towards what are the key attributes for a nonprofit that serves racial minorities trying to seek uh, economic, social, or political justice, uh, and are there attributes that they've consistently demonstrated over their decades long and, and more than a century history that would be worthy of, uh, of replicating or stimulating in like-minded organizations such as where I work at Career Trackers in Australia uh, or other programs I'm connected to with in New Zealand or Mexico or other locations. Uh, and I narrowed that, that, that investigation into six key areas uh, of, 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 of attributes or characteristics or traits that they, that they needed to demonstrate. And, and what they demonstrated was first, and again, you could read this online, we published it on, on Social Ventures Australia website um, in their magazine, uh, which I was recently invited to be a board director of, quite excited. But the attributes were in summary, you've got to demonstrate genuine leadership. You have to have a sense of local ownership in the communities that you serve, uh, meaningful, purposeful partnerships, uh, and not just transactional relationships for the sake of funding. You need a robust business, you need, to engage uh, decision makers who are influential in the in the various aspects of, of, of where you operate, in, whether it be policy or in the community, and a simple program, you know, rather than trying to do a million things at once, the, the really successful organizations were, were good at doing a hand select few things really, really well, and they played into that. And so that, that's in a paper that I published, quite excited, and that will actually be the kind of catalyst to um, a lot of the work that I'll continue to do um, ongoing. Yeah, fantastic. And I'll, I'll share the link with uh, with everyone uh, following the session. Uh, so just taking it back to the application, um, when you first applied for Fulbright, did you have this paper in mind as a tangible output of uh, of your scholarship? Or how, how did you frame that uh, requirement for experiential learning um, in, in nonprofits in order to, to win you the, the scholarship? For sure. I mean, the first thing is it had to be a collaborative project it had to be something of interest to the organization or organizations i was i was going to spend time with but absolutely you know the intention uh, which i outlined was to come back and, pre and present back on this but also to use the knowledge and, and engage other like-minded nonprofits in the sector around it and so there are a handful of uh, organizations that serve aboriginal communities that i've started spending time with and i'll spend more and more time with um, but really, for me, it's an open invitation to um, nonprofits that may serve, um, you know, minority group uh, to look at how do we build strength. And so, uh, from the from the get go, that was uh, what I really tried to articulate in my application as being someone um, that's collaborative and interested to share knowledge and 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 insights. But but in no way would I kind of conclude that uh, you know even in these six attributes that it's the kind of final product. Really, this is kind of taking ideas from the US now, it's about how do we apply that to an Australian context. And so in some ways, the research kind of just begins uh, as, as, as great and as in depth as that might have been for me. Uh, it's just the beginning, I see it as. Yeah, fantastic. That, that's really great to hear, Adam. Um, so I might move over to Karen Hart. Um, Karen, your, your 2014 Fulbright took you to the Nonprofit Centres Network at the Alliance Centre, a Colorado-based organisation that convenes and mobilises a network of nonprofit organisations for-profit businesses, government agencies, academic institutions, and community members to collaboratively create sustainability-focused sorry, sustainability -focused solutions. Can you tell us a bit about your project there? Yeah, so um, my, the interest in, in, um, in going for the, the scholarship, and I just saw it as a fantastic opportunity. I was in the depths of a PhD at the time. And I just thought this is just an amazing opportunity for a not-for-profit leader. And at the time, I was uh, I had been a, um, CEO of uh, a co-located youth service centre out in Sunshine, um, the largest in Australia. And I was taken on in 2005 to outfit an old heritage listed warehouse. Um, and the development team behind me, and talking about standing on, um, you know, the shoulders of giants, had. Um, spent almost eight years voluntarily as a development team, not a board of directors in the sector, but just interested, an interested collective in trying to um, get the money, get the capital uh, funding together, get the concept rounded up um, before they even employed me and, and to secure the building. And so what I learned very early on was that there's a huge gestation period to getting these sorts of centres up and running. 
it takes a lot of goodwill, a lot of um, really well-intentioned um, professionals from every walk, so you know, every walk of life. And um, and I kind of then inherited, you know, uh, the the easy uh, and interesting part of the project. Um, had to finish off a couple of um, uh, funding applications, look for the tenants. I, you know, oversee the the project management of the of the fit out of the warehouse, and um, and then very importantly, get the young people through the door. So we ended up having about twenty different organisations, really prominent not-for-profits across Melbourne, co-locate really for the first time um, in 2005 in, in the centre in the heart of sunshine. And I knew very early on that it was an incredibly innovative project. I'd managed one in the UK for about three years prior to coming here. And, um, and it, it um, never ceased to amaze me why this concept of shared space and shared resources and great opportunities for collaboration um, just wasn't taken off in Australia. Um, and so the, the scholarship gave me a great opportunity to see what was happening um, overseas in, in North America. Um, and I find this little organization, a very small but incredibly dynamic and um, robust little team um, who are part of an organization called the um, uh, Non-Centre uh, Profit Network and um, they were based initially when I started applying for the, for the scholarship in San Francisco and New York and I thought wow this is fantastic um, uh, but by the time I actually got to go in there they had moved to Denver and Colorado <laughs> Not somewhere that I really would have wanted, you know, I didn't have a burning desire to go there, but I thought, well, this is great. Let's see what happens. And um, and it was just a fantastic opportunity to embed myself in a great host organization who uh, were thought leaders and um, collective impact leaders in, in the field of co-located uh, not-for-profit services and the benefits that they can provide within communities and to different client groups. And the Alliance Centre itself was made up of around 40 different organisations, different disciplines, um, so a very mixed sort of centre. And, you know, um, operating out of that environment, you could see, um, you know, the real sort of success factors around how people come together to uh, share resources and to create that sort of amplified impact in what their shared vision for the centre was. So it was just a tremendous experience. Absolutely. And, and so what did you achieve while you were over at the, uh, the Nonprofit Centres Network? So it was kind of, um, there, was, there was two things really going on for me. Um, I really wanted to contribute to what um, NCN, the organisation that I was with, were, were actually doing in terms of building their own capacity as a small organisation. So um, in, in North America, co-location is a very commonplace um, concept and uh, it's, it's uh, you know, quite, quite mature and sophisticated in how um, stakeholders go about uh, constructing and developing and sustaining these sorts of co-located centres. And so I helped work with them on a, a database. Um, I presented at a couple of mini sort of forums that they had around Colorado, um, went to Vancouver and helped them prepare their annual conference. Um, so really just getting involved in the nuts and bolts of the organization itself was really important to me. Um, and, you know, I made some fantastic friends, people who I'm still very closely connected with. Um, uh, you know, even, even today. So that, that was one part of it. The second part, and, and probably the most important part, was the Fulbright Scholarship itself. And um, I had the opportunity of visiting, I guess, and interviewing and spending a lot of time with 10 of me. So, you know, um, 10 CEOs who've been through this long journey of trying to set up a co-locative model um, and spent days with, with some of them but got to um, visit some amazing um, co-located centers and heard their challenges and listened to their successes. And so from that, um, did a thematic analysis around all of these 
deeply rich interviews and came out with seven shared themes around governance and management and finance and so on and, and infrastructure and ownership of um, uh, social purpose real estate and how that buys into the success of these types of projects. Um, so it was just, yeah, it was just an incredible experience, kind of one of those two, um, those two, I, I guess, um, journeys simultaneously and also took advantage of, um, and I can't remember the name of it, you might be able to help Alex, is it a study tour that you can embed within your, your scholarship where you go off to a university and you do some, um, you know, uh, host um, uh, or guest lecturing, so ran a couple of criminal justice and youth work um, workshops there, um, and also spoke to um, some people who were trying to set up a co-located uh, center in Kansas. So yeah, just lots of um, lots of great experiences. That's fantastic. Thanks, Karen. So it's the uh, the Oz to Oz program is, is what Karen's referring to, which is uh, great. There, there are many enrichment um, um, opportunities that we set up for Australian scholars while over in the US, one of which is the Oz to Oz tour where, where Australian scholars can visit Kansas State University and uh, and engage with, with faculty and students there. So, so I'd love to know the, uh, the impact of this award on your career since your, your return. I understand you've had a bit, a bit of a career transition since then. So was the Fulbright any part of that or, or you know, how did that unfold? I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny because you don't always see the fruits of your labor immediately. Um, and sometimes you look back and you wonder why you've got headed down certain paths, especially when you've got a busy job. And so it was kind of twofold because I was doing the PhD at the same time that I was um, doing the Fulbright scholarship. And um, I, now I'm, you know, of course, chair in, in Youth Work and Criminal Justice and Community Development at BU. And I think what really hit home to me was that when you're embedded, sometimes, not in all cases, but when you're embedded within um, this innovative kind of environment, you can't always be objective to it. Um, and you're often um, teaching or and learning with the converted. Um, and, and these sorts of centres still haven't got up in Australia. And um, what I realised, and it's not the only reason, obviously, why I've, I've, I've moved into a different aspect of my career, but um, you can't always uh, achieve what you need to achieve from the inside. I've always been really closely connected with Victoria University and, in fact, um, my ex-boss, um, Professor Robin Broadbent, had been on my board of directors in setting up this co-located centre for many years. And I think um, for me to really make an inroads in trying to, um, I guess, convince and be persuasive to the sector around how these sorts of centres are going to work, I'd like to continue some local research to see um, you know, some of the struggles and some of the barriers and challenges that people are having um, in trying to set up these centres. And I know there's uh, much effort going on in this, um, in this space, but not much success, not, not much successful outcomes. And so that's kind of where all of this is taking me to, to my next sort of area of interest. That's great to hear, Karen. Um, we might move to David Ireland. So David spent four months at uh, Stanford University's Change Labs developing practical initiatives for people and organisations to use towards achieving the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Change Labs and your project there? Sure. Can everyone? Yeah, so my, my project um, was to come up with a better methodology for nudging change at a systems level. And so having worked in this space for quite a while uh, and unfortunately having seen a lot of changes either not work or not be sustainable and kind of stick the, you know, um, you know, last the test of time, the, um, you know, one of the insights that I and, you know, lots of other people have had is that it's often because people are trying to take a linear problem solving process to solving something that's really complex. And so, and when you think about the big challenges that we're facing, and it's everything from climate change to the energy transition, to dealing with pandemics, to equality and whatever else you might want to think about, you know, these are really complex challenges and you need to tackle them through a complex systems approach. And 
that's what change labs do really well. So there are a bunch of experts who sit at the crossroads of lots of different disciplines and approach things with that complex systems point of view. Um, and so it was a really good opportunity for me to learn from global best practice and, and um, help them and help myself come up with some new approaches to do that. Uh, but one of the really good things about being at Stanford, and it would be the same for a lot of the big universities over in the US, was that it meant that I got to engage with lots and lots of other leaders in different disciplines. And so I worked with, you know, people who were, were people who were, you know, sitting at the table when artificial intelligence was invented, you know, like, and, you know, world leading economists and policy experts and behavioral scientists and business model experts. And I think Tessa, you mentioned it before that, you know, having the gift of being able to step out of your job for a few months and talk to really interesting people and think really deeply about a particular problem and try to come up with new stuff. It's just something that you don't get very often. And that was, you know, that was one of the really big, um, you know, that, that was one of the really big values that I got out of, out of uh, my experience and being at Stanford and working with the Change Labs uh, group. Absolutely. Well, I mean, reading your project, it's, uh... You know, it's definitely not small in scale. It deals with really significant uh, challenges and complex challenges, as you mentioned. So in terms of the, the actual uh, application for your Fulbright, how did you sort of bring that down to earth and, and talk about uh, or frame it within that, um, you know, pretty specific context of, you know, experiential learning, um, you know, with, with a nonprofit in the US? Yeah, sure. So... Um, so a few ways. So yeah, you're right. Like I, I have a tendency to for things to go broad, and people always have to bring me back into the specifics. And Fulbright was no exception to that. So thank you. Um, but I guess a couple of things that I did. So uh, yeah. So the the like the the mandate of the of the project was to come up with new methodologies that anybody can use, and you know, and it was a bit of a job of mine was to try to get that out into as many not for profits as I can, and so. You know, back home, back here, I work really closely with Dermot and the team at WWF. I work with quite a few other not-for-profits around Australia trying to help um, transfer some of that knowledge that I generated through my time through the Fulbright experience. But I also work with a few not-for-profits in the US as well. So I own a not-for-profit in the public health sector uh, that's based out of DC. And so um, did a bunch of work with them. I work with some groups around Save the Children and uh, Johns Hopkins University and a few others doing similar things as well. And so it was all about, it was very much, my, my application was very much, this isn't an academic thing. If you if you wanna fund somebody to go and write papers, then don't give me the scholarship. But if you wanna give somebody an opportunity to go and try to come up with stuff and then with multiple avenues to try to put that into practice, then, um, then you know, I'm your guy. And uh, you know, <laughs> Samantha and, and the rest of the panel uh, thought that was pretty good and so gave me the shot. So yeah, so that was kind of where that came from, yeah. Excellent, and in terms of, uh, you know, going out and, and doing stuff, um, you know, how, how did this experience impact you, uh, you know, upon your return, you know, how, how did it affect your tra trajectory within your career and, and within the sector? Yeah, it, I mean, it's it's, it sounds, it sounds a bit silly, but like opportunities like this are transformational. So I, I learned way more than I thought was possible to learn in a four month period. Um, I, I broadened my network, you know, I met everybody from, you know, US government officials, senators to bureaucrats to, you know, industrial, like billionaire industrialists to leaders in academia and not for profit leaders, like just kind of everybody, you pick up the phone or you, you pen an email that says, hey, my name's David, I'm from Australia, I'm a Fulbright Scholar over at Stanford, can we have a meeting? And I reckon like 90, 99 times out of 100, I got a response saying, yeah, sure. Yeah, let me know when you're free and we'll have a coffee. And so like, that was really amazing. It just broadened my experiences and um, my knowledge base and what I thought was possible. It kind of helped me set my goals a bit higher as well. That's another thing that I think is, is um, just a really good, a uh, bit of exposure when you go to the US is that they, I think they sometimes have a bit of a different mentality around what they are willing to give a go, you know? And so, you know, often I, I have found in the past in Australia, when you talk to people about doing something, you often get, a, oh, look, that's pretty tough or we've tried it before, or I don't know. You, you ask those questions in the US and people are often like, yeah, sure, let's let's do it. What do you need? Let's have a chat. Let's see what we can do. 
And so I think that, you know, being around those people and seeing, um, seeing what they're willing to do and uh, yeah, it was, was, you know, really helped me, um, you know, rethink what, what my impact and what my contribution can be. Absolutely. And, and definitely there is that sort of air of, uh, you know, they really believe in the power of, of positive thinking over there. So uh, that combined with um, the fact that Fulbright, I've heard from alumni that, that uh, someone said that Fulbright is the, the key that unlocks all doors in the US. And uh, I've heard from quite a few alumni who've said that just mentioning the name Fulbright can get you into mm. some really interesting places. So that's, that's one of the benefits of the scholarship yeah. is that it's quite well known over there. And um, uh, you know, everyone's willing to help out a, a Fulbright scholar. Um, so a requirement for the, the program uh, for all scholarships uh, under Fulbright is uh, this sort of relevance of, of uh, the proposal to the US. Um, you know, why, why does this research, why does this study need to be undertaken in the US? Um, Dermot, I'll throw to you. Um, your, your work with WWF has uh, quite global significance. How did you frame this in terms of its US relevance? And I, I think twofold. The, the first one is was just that um, the size of the not-for-profit sector in the US is enormous and um, incredibly diverse. And I, I think we've just heard from all the um, other panelists about different areas. And so um, there is a, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of experience. And as, as Karen talked about, they're, they're doing things in the US that we're not really doing here in Australia, or certainly not at, at scale. Um, the second piece is a little bit on David's point. I have found in my interactions into the US in the not-for-profit sector that there is a there's an inner drive for innovation and to doing new things. Now, part of that might be because the competition is so stiff in terms of raising money, but certainly um, some of the frameworks that are there are, make a huge difference in terms of doing some fairly radical thinking about what a not-for-profit is from the beginning, um, where civil society might be going over the next uh, few years and linking that to big things. So there's a think tank in, the U in Stanford, or no, outside Stanford, which is called the Fourth Industrial Revolution um, team, which David knows about. And, the interface between that type of group that are thinking about the fourth industrial revolution and the role of civil society is an interface you don't see, um, I don't see much in Australia happening. Yeah, absolutely. And they're definitely at the forefront um, of that kind of learning over there. Uh, Adam, um, we touched on this a little bit um, earlier, but, but how did you frame your proposal in terms of its uh, US relevance? I think there's two sides for me. One is that the, my host organization was interested in the global relevance of their vision. You know, we're, as I mentioned before, a 10 year old version of what they've been doing for 50 years. Um, and to see for them, there's quite a lot of excitement and interest to see, okay, they've been doing this for 50 years, just in the US. How is this same kind of concept uh, real for other communities right around the world? Um, and so there's that interest. And then the other part of that is the, the, the spin-off is there, there's an interest in um, simplicity and being a younger, really ambitious and driven and driven version of, of, of what they've been doing can become kind of complicated after, you know, adding layers and layers and layers in, in, a, in a mission or an organization. And so we do things in a really agile way, um, you know, with the bare minimum. And so I think that there was a, an interest in in exploring the younger version of, of, of themselves. I mentioned before that the US has been on a long road to, to racial justice. And I found myself continually saying in various meetings with kind of, you know, solutions and ideas and insights. It was just a very raw and simple way for them to paint the picture of, of, of ways forward. Um, and so I think that they really appreciated that. I, I, I at least tried to articulate some of those things in my application. Um, if I could go back and rewrite it again, that's that's probably how I would tackle it. Well, I think you, you probably did a pretty good job. Um, so Karen, how about you? How did you make the case for visiting the Alliance Centre? Um, 
visiting the Alliance Centre, well, the, the, the case around the need to find out more about how you construct and sustain co-located services, particularly for the human service sector, um, I thought absolutely was, was quite straightforward because we just don't have enough of it here. We've got a lot of really good examples of for-profit um, hubs. Uh, like, you know, the Dream Dream Factory to an extent, I suppose, Donkey Wheel House, the hub in the city, um, but but no real, um, uh, there, there's certainly no critical mass in, in um, you know, for purpose, um, co-located hubs. And so uh, the North America, you know, there's, there's 500 of these, um, these centers. But I think they started, the, the trajectory of, of these centres started off through the, um, you know, the corporate world, trying to find better ways of collaborating, having small startups um, housed together uh, to create, um, you know, interdisciplinary think tanks. And, and then that sparked the not-for-profit sector into thinking, well, we can do this and it makes absolute sense because you have a backbone or lead organization who essentially manages or coordinates the, the activity within the center. Everybody else pays um, a competitive rent and uh, which means that the headache is taken away from their for, pur for purpose mission and they can get on with the, the job of their not-for-profit. So, it makes absolute sense. I'm hoping the same is happening in Australia and that um, our day will come when, uh, you know, we can really start building um, a, a stronger and more cohesive and collaborative sector in that respect. Mm. And I'm uh, sorry to answer your question quickly. The Alliance Centre was a bit of a no-brainer because the host organisation um, where, where I was going to be based had embedded themselves within that centre and were living there. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, and David, uh, you, you actually, you touched on this quite a bit uh, just, just earlier, but uh, I guess if you could give an elevator pitch for why your, your uh, work needed to be done at Stanford in California, why, how, how would you make that, that pitch? It's unfair, Alex, an elevator pitch off the, off the cuff. The, um, yeah, look, I, I mean, I touched before on, you know, they're experts in this type of methodology, so that was really great. Um, but probably the two things that I didn't talk about, um, one is that a lot of the work that I do is um, kind of at the, at the, you know, where not-for-profit crosses over into the for-profit sector and trying to think about, well, what's the biz what are the business models that can straddle both and help the not-for-profits, you know, grow faster or, you know, become less reliant on donors or, you know, whatever else it might be. And they do a lot of that work as well. So that was really good. The other point, and this is probably a more general point, but I had worked with the Change Lives people before. And one of the things that I really liked about them was that um, they were, uh, that, like, I, there was a, a really nice um, kind of behavior and culture within there where everybody challenged each other in a really nice way. And so I knew that I was going to go there and I was going to have four months of kind of being intellectually challenged. And, you know, I'd put up an idea and they'd be like, you know, and they'd, they'd grill me on it. They'd be like, why is that better? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? And that was, um, you know, that was really, that was really valuable uh, as opposed to some other labs that I've worked in, in the past where people don't really pay much attention to what you're doing. So yeah, they, they really tested me and made me be the best version of me while I was over there. Again, sounding a bit silly, but there you have it. That's an excellent elevator pitch. Um, that's great. And, and look, in some ways, well, in many ways, you know, Fulbright is all about challenging yourself. Uh, and even, you know, the, the first step is, is through this application. So uh, I've heard many people talk about the application as an opportunity to sort of put yourself out on a page uh, and uh, really take a look uh, you know, self-reflection and, and look at where you want to you want to go in the next five years. So um, uh, that's, that's a great point, thanks, David. Uh, Tessa, so how did you how did you frame the why why the US in your proposal? 
Well, I, I suppose my proposal was really to say that for any purpose-driven organisation and, and charities, perhaps more than other nonprofits are, are an example of that, for any purpose-driven organisation, we need to have the support of the communities that we're here to help in order to be effective in achieving our impact. And there's no better example in the world than the United States in terms of looking at what charities and nonprofits have done themselves to demonstrate their impact. So the infrastructure of the nonprofit sector in the US, the architecture of the efforts around transparency and accountability have been built by purpose-driven organisations in the US to build trust and confidence in what they do. And that was just the perfect example to look at what that might look like and think about how to translate that into the Australian context. And I think, you know, in many ways, a lot of the things that I was looking at, you know, this was back in 2014, we've started to see a lot more translation of the lessons from the US in the context of, um, you know, Philanthropy Australia now has a partnership with what was then the Foundation Centre. So where I did my Fulbright, Philanthropy Australia has developed a partnership with them to build the transparency of Australia's philanthropic sector, really unheard of six or seven years ago. Um, I think charities more broadly and, and to some extent research organisations are increasingly interested in the social and economic impact of this sector. But six, seven years ago, there were just very few examples of what that might look like in the Australian context and a flourishing environment of that in the US that we could really learn from. Absolutely. So it was, it was definitely a, a proposal ahead of its time. Um, and I'd really like to hear a, a perspective from, from one of the award sponsors. Uh, so uh, Australian Scholarships Foundation CEO Sam Sayers is, is with us on the panel. Uh, she's played an active role in candidate selection for the past couple of years. So Sam, in your opinion, obviously thanks so much for joining us. Um, in your opinion, what, what makes a strong application for, for this award? Great that I'm going last, Alex, because I think um, all the panellists today have done an amazing job really articulating, I guess, their area of focus uh, and impact in, a, in an Australian context, you know, each in their discrete areas of work. Um, but what made their application so compelling from the perspective of the panel was they were able to then draw on an example that they found in a US context. Um, and again, there's been some terrific examples given, you know, Adam spoke about they're a 10 year organisation looking to an organisation that's been doing that work at scale for 50 years. So drawing very clear learning links, if you like, between the work that they're doing in Australia and the work that they, or the innovation that they see happening in the US. And then being able to very clearly articulate how they will take that learning, um, I guess, you know, extract as much as they can from that experience and bring that learning back and apply that to their own work in an, in an Australian context that benefits um, Australian society. So Fulbright, um, the Australian Fulbright Commission is unashamedly an Australian-US partnership um, and we've seen some amazing proposals over the years that have perhaps had um, a more international focus or a focus so applicable in an Australian context. So I would say that that's really fundamental to be a success is obviously to have a compelling application, which clearly you've heard some examples of those today. And I think what's wonderful is they're very disparate. So there are, you know, such a, such a broad range of work that's taken place here um, through the panellists that have been speaking today. But each of them have identified, I guess, an advancement through a collaboration with a US institution or entity and have been able to then demonstrate how they will bring that learning back for the benefit of Australian society. That's, that's really fantastic, uh, the way you've uh, found a common thread among all those very, very different proposals. Uh, so that's really useful advice. Uh, I'd absolutely agree with that. Um, and and how, how, in terms of, um, practically speaking, how do you evaluate research proposals? And are there any specific metrics that, that you, or, or touch points that you look it's for? It's hard, um, really hard. And as the panellists will know, um, it's, it's a significant amount of work to submit a Fulbright. Um, so I guess... I'm sure the panellists could speak to and in fact it might be helpful for people to share how much time they did invest in preparing their applications because they are um, quite detailed and, and lengthy documents but I think that's essential because there's got to be a level of granularity around um, the work that you're doing, um, how you plan to further that work through the US, what, what's the evidence base that's leading you to sort of to want to go to this particular institution in the US to further your knowledge and learning and then I guess you know most critically how do you plan to bring that learning back and, and apply it in an Australian context for the benefit of Australian society. Absolutely and, and I mean do you have any uh, do you have any general advice for, for anyone in the audience who's, who's interested in applying? Um, I 
I guess for support of um, the organisation, you know, strong connections to an institution that you want to work with is really important and evidence of that is, um, is also very important. I guess the panel needs to be able to see that you've built strong networks into organisations and perhaps not just one organisation, but have started to build a network internationally or sorry, in the US that's going to further um, your study, that's quite important. And then obviously the support of peers and colleagues and your own organisation if you are an employee um, in terms of a willingness to support you and back you to, to make the most of this particular opportunity. That's also quite important, that sort of authorising environment around the applicant. Um, and I guess too, there's a, as you'll, I guess, have observed just listening to people speak, there's a, you know, this is a, a really senior weighty group of leaders and we've seen some amazing applications in the past um, and, you know, part of our feedback sometimes is, you know, come back in 10 years, we, you know, we've seen, um, I guess the opportunity, Fulbright is such a transformational opportunity. So as you had alluded to, Alex, at the right at the start, there's a sort of seniority profile that's important there in terms of um, being senior enough that you're able to uh, take that learning and apply it and drive that change um, through your own organisation and more broadly to the state and society is quite important. That's really great advice. Thanks so much, Sam. And I might put it to the, the, the other panelists. Uh, your question: how, how much time did uh, did each of you put into your Fulbright applications when you when you first and, and seriously considered it? Um, Tessa said she she took leave to prepare her application time really well spent. Uh, so Tessa, how how long did you spend uh, preparing? Um, look, it's absolutely true that the, the time spent on the application is the biggest investment in terms of being successful. Um, so I spent a couple of months thinking through my proposal, making contact in the US. All of the people I worked with were people I had no relationships with before I developed the proposal. So I really used that time. I had colleagues review it. I had people outside of the sector review my proposal to make sure that it was communicating, you know, impact and, and broad value beyond a sort of a niche or a kind of specialist audience. And actually, by the end of it, this is going to sound really corny, but I'd already learned quite a lot by the time I'd finished the application. And I've found that since that sometimes those, you know, it, it can be opportunity cost if you're not successful, but sometimes that process itself can be a, a really useful investment. And in my case, it, it really paid off in terms of having the opportunity to then go and spend the four months um, really embedding myself on a lot of issues that I was starting to get really, really interested in. That's great. And I'm glad to hear you say that because, like I said, I, I do think it's, it's a great opportunity for self-reflection and, and to sort of put yourself down on, on a page and, and analyse your, uh, your own goals, um, not just for the award, but for your, your career in general. Uh, Dermot, how about you? How long did you spend on the application? Alex, just, just quickly, I mean, I think I spent two years thinking about this, not in the context of I want to go and do a Fulbright Scholar, but about the issue itself. So... I'd done a lot of thinking and writing and the sort of things that Tessa talked about. Um, I didn't sit down one day and say, what do I want to do a Fulbright scholarship? Like someone, Karen said, I think, I ended up taking the whole weekend and two days, which four full days is quite a large amount of time at the end of that, just to write um, the final application, having done a little bit more. So it's sort of, it, it does require a lot of thinking and um, prep in advance. And, and Karen, uh, David or, or Adam, feel free to jump in. Do, do, do you have any additional comments on, on um, a good lead-in time for a Fulbright? Um, I have spent a lot of dark hours doing my application. And by dark, I mean in the middle of the night when I'm supposed to be doing my PhD before I get off to work. So at about half three, four o'clock in the morning, which incidentally I think is the best time of day when there's nobody else around. <laughs> um, and so I did, I did invest very heavily in the application. Um, it, it was quite a journey in itself, the application. And uh, one of the most soul searching uh, aspects of it was the personal statement. Um, and I think that's just, um, that, that's a, a, a real little trick of genius to, to put that in because you've actually, we're used to writing big tenders, big applications, big, you know, job, applications and talking about our professional selves and what that means to us but rarely do we actually get the opportunity of putting on an A4 to A4 side pages something about your personal journey um, aside from all of that professional stuff and so I really had to reflect 
heavily over the years around what my journey looked like. And so my, my advice is absolutely put your best uh, into that personal statement because it really does make you shine as a human being and a person and um, lends a little bit of, um, uh, I suppose, in, enlightening magic to an application that is quite formal and, um, and, and, and pretty tough, but so worth it. So worth it. One of the greatest investments of my life, for sure. Excellent. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm really sorry, we've gone over time a little bit. Uh, so just finally, um, if, if anyone on the panel just has some um, final advice for anyone in the audience who's, who's interested in applying for Fulbright and anyone in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question uh, to, to anyone on the panel, feel free to pop it in the chat box or in the Q&A. I would only say just go for it. Like, I, I don't know what other advice you, you should need to have other than give it a go. And if you get a pushback from Sam in the panel saying, come back in a couple of years, like don't take that as a no, take that as a legitimate come back in a couple of years. Um, and uh, yeah, come back in a couple of years and do it. Cause it's such, it's such an amazing experience. Yeah, I just can't, can't say that strongly enough. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks. So, so this is such a, it's such a prized opportunity to, to go for this. I had, I think a really deep respect for the opportunity. And after my interview in those moments of reflection, and, you know, I thought, did I do a good job? I thought I may have stuffed it up. And you know what? I knew that I had put so much work into the application and I defined the problem and my kind of personal motivations and ambition in such a profound way. I think because I had such a respect for the opportunity that even if I didn't get it, I knew that I was actually better off in constructing the ideas that I did that regardless of whatever I did next, it was going to contribute to what I did. And so absolutely resonate with that message of go for it. Excellent. That's, that's really great advice. Uh, well, look, that's, that's all, all the time we have. If you think of a question, uh, feel free to email it in. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get back to you uh, as soon as we can. Um, thanks so much to, to all of our panellists. Um, uh, Fulbright scholarships are open until uh, July 6 this year so jump on our website uh, start your application and uh, as, as all the panelists said go for it because uh, it's a fantastic opportunity and uh, you, you won't regret uh, applying uh, thanks again uh, everyone on the panel um, thanks to everyone in the audience and I uh, hope you have a fantastic day look forward to seeing your Fulbright applications <laughs>